nothing great in this world has been accomplished without passion and if there's something you want to do and you're passionate for it then just do it stop talking about it today we are going to meet a very passionate person mr beta mahatavraj who's passionate about indian native fish when it comes to doing things he's done it he's that person you can say he's been there and done it and at this point i'm going to just shut up and let him do the talking okay come on let's go and meet beta mahatavraj So firstly of course this video is going to be in english because uh, it's convenient for beta and me to converse in english and yes we are here today we are meeting beta mahatavraj in my opinion probably india's most experienced or learned person or hobbyist with in relation to indian native fish if there is an indian native fish beta knows about it yeah almost and now yeah this is beta uh, greek beta not beta or beta and if you are all confused or curious yes he has an elder brother called alpha also now if you are born to a scientist you get names called alpha beta that's how it works <laughs> correct so firstly beta thank you so much for joining us in this little episode where i get to ask you a lot of questions on indian native fish of course i call you and ask you a lot but this is of course on video and there's enough people who want to know a lot about indian native fish Beta, before we start off this video, there is something that's going on in my mind, and I particularly want to do this seriously. Where one is, I want to use hashtag Save Indian Fish as a common thing. I want to basically make this as an eye opener for the departments, for the government, yeah. saying that you know there is a beautiful uh, ecosystem that we are not considering in our systems. You know. Yeah. why because see whenever i go for these tiger reserves and all of these places there are beautiful streams and if you ask the naturalist or ask anybody what kind of fish do you have because you can't get down yeah. and go and see yeah. they say we don't know sir yeah. now i think that's a very sad thing especially for people like us who love uh, fish so there's something that i'm trying to work out and uh, probably we'll explain that in the link once we've come up with it it's some kind of a cause that you may have to sign up for and uh, we will take that forward and publish it to the government and see what can be done until then use the hashtag save indian fish okay you'll use it too yeah all right okay so let's continue our conversation beta why uh, aquariums or why fish keeping <clears throat> i think it started quite a long time back uh, so i spent my childhood in kerala okay. and uh, we were in ernakulam or right now it's called kochi right for some yeah. time and we actually used to have a stream that is running you know within our compound oh, to nice. say right and one of the activities that i loved to do at that time was after coming back to school me and the you know the neighbors kids we all used to go into the stream and catch fishes and i think that's what it sparked off because i started observing fishes right then but then we moved around a lot after that because my dad was getting transferred so only after i got back to chennai in 1987 yeah i know for all the Jens years it's quite a long time back yeah, you are only 24 <laughs> yeah i am 23 actually <laughs> yeah that's the secret between us so anyway so the, uh, we came back to chennai in 87 and that's when i started i would say after a very short break yeah. probably 2 or 3 years i started keeping fishes so one of my uncles my dad's uh, younger brothers actually gifted me my first proper aquarium, proper aquarium. till then uh, i used to have it them in you know cement tanks and so on and kind of started there and it kept growing uh, quite at an alarming pace especially for my parents because by the time i was in 10th standard i probably we had around 20 tanks all around the house right at that point you know, i used to keep cichlids and so on uh, but as years went by my interest sustained right and that's when i put up a fish room for myself that's outside the house okay uh, where i could enjoy my hobby in peace <laughs> without being judged right see i think all of us have gone through this journey of starting very little and at a very young age and then moving forward yeah. and i think you and me have been lucky because uh, our families have been supportive yeah uh, in this uh, respect see for me my mom again my mama was very influential because of pets and fish keeping and all of that i wanted to keep birds but i was told no no birds are noisy so keep fish okay. and they re- they didn't realize that by the time i was uh, you know again 12th or I think there were like 25 tanks all around the house so yeah. anyway so that that aside what does fish keeping actually mean to you because 
see uh, you're a you're an it professional yeah. okay but you still come back to uh, aquariums and aquarium keeping of course we'll show you peter's fish room through this video what does it mean to you um i would say at this stage of the last 15 years or so uh, it's no longer a hobby for me okay. uh, i would say it's a uh, passion passion because typically uh, say you keep a pet for example right mm. you want to interact with it and you want to feel the love back from mm. it for me it's not like that for me it's more like uh, something that i'm passionate about and i want to study and i want to observe mm. rather than wanting me uh, wanting my fishes to interact with me right see we i talk a lot about observation in most of my videos and i i tell people that you if you look at your fish there's a lot you can learn and i'm i'm not just saying learn about the fish i'm saying uh, just generally in a spiritual sense in a psychological sense in a scientific sense there's so much that one can learn from yeah. this hobby right what can you add to that yeah i, I would say that uh, you get a very deep appreciation of nature first of all right yeah. especially if you initially i was keeping aquariums i was keeping mm. fishes but only when i went into the actual habitats where you know the fishes some of the fishes we keep live uh, that's when you truly appreciate you know nature uh, it teaches you a lot of things especially uh, coexistence because you, your hobby might be fish right but when you go to look at a fish habitat you see plants you see insects you see amphibians you see reptiles you see birds you see you mammals. see that whole circle of yeah, life yeah, kind yeah. of a situation yeah. no? so how it, or a symbiotic relationship right and right. stuff like that it's like a small <clears throat> universe by itself right even a small yeah. stream is a universe by, by itself. itself so i think it really humbles you and you get a better appreciation for true, nature very true very true very true why this passion for uh, indian natives um i think i've gone through the typical phases right right and i think i started really young because i had you know the fishes like discus i had altamangels and i had all the you know south american mm. uh, the west african cichlids and all mm. that i think the first few fishes that i kept was the what they call orange chromite um so they actually sh they are an indian cichlid and they show an amazing parental care yes. right uh, similar yes. to any other most other cichlids, cichlids. I, i think it started with that uh, because you know suddenly i realized this fish is from india right and somehow it doesn't get that appreciation or you know yeah. we don't have the awareness that you have such a beautiful fish uh, you know right within city limits because back then i remember even within the city limits you could find this fish uh, and that's when i started exploring you know going into uh, you know the ponds nearby ponds and so on exploring what fishes are there and i realized that we are no, you, quite a you just you just go don't go into the ponds your whole family you take them <laughs> to the ponds and streams <laughs> and stuff like that yeah. i see that in your uh, channel and videos yeah. by the way see you there is a beautiful channel called mean karan mean karan is a tamil word it means aquaman fisherman a fisherman yeah that's what aquaman is more gen z yeah, yeah so uh mean current the link is there in my description and the link is here as well you can go and see a lot of indian species of fish on the channel and i i believe that your channel needs more views i mean you it deserves it because of the immense amount of quality videos you have on indian fish why do you think that indian fish don't get the appreciation they deserve because i personally believe uh, you know like the cardinal tetra or something like that in this kind of a tank we could have like the sayadrinses or the maharaja bad yeah. okay a few of them yeah. and it will look far more stunning than cardinal tetras yeah why is it that indian fish don't get the recognition i think one is obviously that uh, you need some patience for them to bloom as mm. such right uh, it's not something that you just catch from the wild put it in your tank and immediately you, you know you can see it knowledge glory you need to put some work into it give it especially because it's a wild caught fish it needs its time to settle down and kind of uh, adapt to captive condition then it will show it right so i think that's one part where uh, typically indian native fishes sometimes it's displayed in a fish store in a bare bottom tank and there's no color and there's no color yeah. right but it's only when you bring it into your home give it a nice the environment, environment right yeah. that's when they really reward you with you know colors, colors and their behavior and, 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 and so on yeah. the other side is that uh, i think underwater is a different world you can see a tiger you can go into a forest and see a tiger but it's a lot more challenging for most people to observe what is underwater, is underwater. and uh, first time when i you know put on a snorkel and i went under water you know truly opened up a, you know a different world for me right? kind of so, a pandora's box yeah, kind of a situation yeah. where you know the, the whole thing changed and said yeah. oh my god this so much more 
Yeah. So and much a lot more. of people don't get the, I would say, privilege to do that, right? Because it is I not agree. as easy as walking to a street. No, taking a look or going for a safari. And yeah, yeah, it's not you as You really easy. need to at least, you know, put on a snorkel. Yeah, there is a lot of snorkeling activities and all that for the more for the marine side of it, in a reef and so on. But freshwater, there is not so much. See, do you believe that uh, also the the government plays a big role in, in you know, the publicity of these fish? Because I understand that uh, almost all Indian fish are bad. Yeah, I wouldn't say all Indian fish is a band. There are a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, both of them are snakeheads. Uh, one is obviously the Channa Barka, which is found in the Assam area. And another one is the uh, subterranean uh, snakehead called uh, Enigma Chala. So Enigma Chala. Off late, even the Denisoni has come on to the... Yeah, I think there is uh, a deliberation whether it has to go into yeah. the list. But the final list didn't have it. See, because what, what I see is... Now, the, take the Denisoni for an example. The Pontius Denisoni, right? Or it's what is it called? Yeah, it's kind of... I prefer to call it Sayadriya Denisoni. Sayadriya Denisoni, uh, yeah, okay. The most recent publication has it as Pantius, but I think there's a lot more work to be done on there. I'll go with and, what you say because I trust your judgment on that. So it's the Sayadriya Denisoni. Today, we, we don't get the fish in India, okay? Or even if it is, it's somewhere there in some lay, uh, stream in Kerala. It's all imported. <laughs> comes in from Indonesia. And that's a sad thing, right? It's our fish, it's an Indian fish, it's an Indian native species and someone else is breeding it and selling it back to us. Do you think that from the government side, there should be more support or if you don't want to answer that, that's fine. Yeah. No, no. So, one correction I want to make is that, yeah, a lot of the international supply of Denisoni is from Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, but there is still uh, some amount of, you know, wild caught Denisoni that is available within India. Uh, but it's very less. Uh, I think since the market for it internationally has gone down in terms of, you know, an export standpoint, the local collection of that species has also gone down. But on the government's role, I would say that uh, there are attempts, uh, especially... There's some work being done on, I think, the Mashirs. And there is a bit of work being done on the Denison as well. But then in, if you look at the biodiversity of Indian fishes, it's huge. Yeah, it's very So big. it really requires a concerted True. effort. Uh, probably each state government taking a look at the fishes that are there in their river systems and probably collaborating, you know, across borders to actually make this happen. Mm. There's, there's another uh, approach to this because I understand, see, the government, I know for a fact, Department of Fisheries and all, I meet a lot of people. They work a lot on the food related something that can be eaten they do a lot of work on it they have a lot of studies on it they have funds for it do you think it makes sense that you know um, they also support the ornamental business in the sense uh, um, you know support more people to do research or breeding and we have so many hobbies who have a lot of information and knowledge. Will that make sense to better uh, the hobby for Indian fish? So I would say one thing is that obviously I'm not on the trade. Yeah. So I don't have a very clear view on whether, you know, how much support the trade is getting mm. from the government. Uh, but what I can say based on my interaction with, you know, uh, people from the scientific community, there's a quite a bit of study that's going on. There's quite a bit of, uh, you know, conservation related focus that is there. How well it is funded by the government. Mm. Uh, what is a push? I'm because not most sure. of our rivers, no, I mean, whatever conservation they try, they, they have not been able to stop the pollu pollution. Yeah. Okay. That is one of the biggest problems that all rivers are going to face. Yeah. The, still, people are washing clothes and washing their vehicles and all of this is going on in every yeah. river that you see. So, I, I would say from my experience going into the, uh, you know, different uh, areas, there are a couple of things which make it a bit complicated, uh, the conservation part of it. One is the invasive species that are there, right? Both yeah. like the, you know, the... Plecostomas, kind of uh, the plecos, right? Catfishes, which are more aquarium escapees or releases. And then there is the food fishes, like, uh, you know, all the... The catfish and all the tilapias uh, and cutlers and African and catfishes. Uh, these do not respect, you know, state borders yeah. or anything, right? True. Or even whether it is a wildlife sanctuary, right? They don't know. They don't yeah. know and they don't care, right? So they can move into different areas. And somewhat in the last 10 years, I've seen is a big impact that is happening, especially on hills stream fishes and fishes which are uh, you know more sensitive, sensitive in, in a sense yeah is sand mining yeah right because earlier this month i had visited a place in karnataka you know to look for a small species of gobi called i mean it's commonly called redneck gobi mm. most of these places either there is very less water or the water was very muddy mm. because there is work happening for you know building bridges and bridges. so on so we didn't even find a single one of those right uh, so there is some habitat and you're not sure there. if they're there or not yeah you yeah. don't know yeah if the uh, hobby is watching us and they want some kind of a 
database or data bank where they can refer to all different kinds of Indian fish. Is there something like that, a website or something that somebody can refer to? Uh, that's a bit tricky because the ones which have very good information does not have, you know, color pictures and uh. easy descriptions, right? For hobbies, right? So it was a struggle for me. So I was actually forced to read those books, books like uh, Casey Jairam's, Dr. Casey Jairam's book or Dr. A.G. K. Menon's book, which are basically checklist of freshwater fishes. And that gives keys to identification, which says, for example, this will have so many spines in the dorsal fin and things like that. It'll have so many scales, right? Yeah, so it's that too is, technical. Yeah, it is too technical. Yeah. So that is a bit difficult. Uh, if you have interest, you can do it. The other alternatives are little, uh, I would say they're not comprehensive enough. Yeah. Uh, there is There are some books on Western Guard fishes. Again, I would say it's a bit outdated, not the perfect information. There are some on Northeast fishes which have photos of preserved specimens, right? As a hobbyist, we yeah. usually look at live specimens, so it will be very difficult. So, I would say at this point, you know, you can look at uh, internet resources or you can get in touch with uh, ichthyologists or people like me who do some, you know, field work, right? So, we can help you. But I can't pinpoint any one book which can you know, help you with that. So I think it is a, it's still an area that requires. I, I, this is something I want to share with you. I mean, of course, you know, I love telling stories. So, you know, so uh, for everybody, um, I was young and uh, very curious about fish and fish keeping because we had this pond in front of our house in Bangalore and uh, my grandfather said, okay, let's put fish into it. And he was also very interested because it's something nice was going to happen in front of the house. And uh, so he said, you know what, I'll take you to University of Agricultural Sciences in Hebal in Bangalore. And there is a fisheries department there. You can go and talk to them and see if you want to learn something and all of that. I walked into the room and all I could smell was formalin and see dead fish. I walked to the room and I said, Grandfather, let's go. They don't know how to keep the fish alive because that's what we want to do. They know how to kill the fish. Yeah. So this preserved species, they don't show anything. They don't show any color. Yeah. Nita, uh, tell me this, how many different places in India have you been to uh, behind going and seeing the fish? So, so let's say from the south uh, all the way up till the east. No, north. I've uh, kind of restricted my area of study, you could say, to the western guards and eastern guards and especially between Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Kerala. Right? Okay, so the south of India. Yeah, south mm -hmm. of India, right? Uh, because... I mean, I have a full-time job, I have a family as well. It's not very easy for me yes. to, you know, kind of disappear for one and a half weeks to the northeast and so on, right? So, I prefer where I can go for like four or five days. Mm. And it's usually, you know, something which is very well planned because I know what species I'm going to look Correct. for. And I kind of do the research on where it can be found based on, you know, the type of species, right? So, it's like that, right? So, mm. most of my work is around in the south, southern part of India. Can we expect a book or something from Beta? Uh, we fish we... keeping because... The the amount of data you have, I don't think a lot of people have. Yeah, I would love to do that. Uh, I wanted to start a bit small. So one of my friends has got friend has got some ideas on working on a first at a small level, put a small book. Yeah. It's got some hundred species. So we'll start with that. Uh, I've been kind of slacking on that. So probably we will do that this year. But more, I think this year I've planned more to go to schools and talk about Indian native fishes. That's kind of my plan this year. Yeah, but a book is something definitely that I'm looking for. And I'm already collaborating with a uh, few people in the science scientific community uh, to get my photos on See, the books and so on. I am sure a lot of people watching this right now are already commenting saying I want a book. Okay. <laughs> That's how quick they are going to respond. So, you know, something like this is going to, uh, you know, really add value. Now, let's do a few silly questions. Eh? Okay. So, which is your favorite Indian fish? I, I mean, your favorite Indian fish yeah. or the, I'll come, uh, your favorite Indian fish. Yeah, I mean, there is no competition. There is okay. a fish called uh, Bavania australis. Okay. It's found in the Western Guard streams in uh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka okay. and Kerala. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a fish which is evolved to survive in, you know, hill streams, which means okay. that uh, they compress, they're very kind of aerodynamic okay. and they can withstand, you know, uh, you know, the, the high water flow. Right? Okay. Which is the most beautiful Indian species that you've seen, but the most colorful, beautiful. I would say the Maharaja Barb is something. Yeah, Sayadrinses or Maharaja Barb. Yeah, especially if you see it in the wild, a male in its breeding colors is out of this world. Dennis and I definitely, but then we were so used to seeing it. I yeah. think we have kind of got true, desensitized. True, true. So it's kind of gone below the ranking. 
uh, but there are a lot of very beautiful snakeheads and small fishes in northeast india yeah. uh, there are some like uh, you know there's a uh, danio megalensis is there that's a very beautiful fish uh, danio jaintianensis another small uh, danio very beautiful fishes uh, jaintianensis for example is not seen in the trade much because it's quite delicate and mm-hmm. needs cooler waters but there are quite a few beautiful fishes which is the worst fish to keep in an aquarium and i'm not saying indian i'm saying in general the worst fish to keep in an aquarium i believe it's the common pleco what is definitely. your yeah definitely that's one anything which is going to grow too big for a aquarium yeah. is definitely danger uh, because most of the time something like a red tail catfish right which grows very yeah, rapidly very rapidly uh, there's a chance that even you know public aquariums will not be willing to take it take from it you from because you. i mean we see a lot of that giant gouramis yeah, red tail yeah. catfish plecos or yeah. even the regular sharks that you know yeah, the all of those you know, pangaceous yeah, 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 they, yeah. They, it's too yeah um which is the indian fish that people should not keep uh i would think anything which has a i mean i i would you know put, change it a little differently okay. right you can keep any fish as long as it's legal if you are well prepared for it right don't try and keep something which is uh, which you will not be able to provide the conditions with like for example i do keep hill stream fishes which are from pretty cold waters but then i provide the cooling i also provide the flow right yeah. so i would say yeah you can keep any fish you want as long as you can you know provide give the right, the right environment yeah. and provide yeah. what it needs especially because you are taking it from the wild there's a bigger responsibility right because it's something that is moving out of the wild so you better as a responsible hobbyist give it the conditions that you can true. best give true. it right true. true true so true so true so true i think we've discussed you know quite a lot of uh, we we've, we've touched a spiritual a scientific uh, kind of a, the silly parts of it as well now i want to discuss something that you know the do's and don'ts for hobbies you know see a lot of people write to me saying that you know we have a stream behind our house i caught some fish i put it in a bottle and uh, now what to do so what is it that if in few steps like three or four steps that even if people catch from the wild step one how do they bring it back to their homes step two what should they have and what should they feed first advice would be uh, if you want to start with native fishes mm. start with something which is found closer to your home because you will be better uh, equipped to handle the you know the water right from the water temperature to the water chemistry it might be similar right and also it's not stressful on the fish because you are moving it probably an hours journey from mm. where it is found right uh, now coming to you know so if, let me add here so when you are moving ideally you want it you want to collect water from there and you know you want to collect clean water from there and yeah. move it and if you have an oxygen pack it's always better right right, right. Yeah. yeah the option is like you You, you can oxygen pack it or there is a, pro- a product called breather bags like semi permeable so there is a gas exchange you can do that as well as long as it's not a fish with you know spines right mm. which might tear it a regular precaution right one is that uh, while you might find fishes in pretty warm areas that doesn't mean that you know you can take the fish put it in a like a cover or something like that and keep it in the sun that's probably the number one reason that you know they don't survive because suddenly they are exposed to very high temperature is because usually the water temperature is little lower than you know the the surface temperature the yeah, the water warms up very quickly yeah. in that packet yeah yeah, yeah. so that that's one thing uh, another is obviously only bring what you can manage right so if you have only a 2 foot tank think of that be responsible and not bring too many fishes let's say you can bring four or five fishes to know maybe select the best that you've caught mm. leave out the rest right and just bring back that yeah, yeah? that yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah or yeah. bring smaller fish smaller right? fish yeah because the eight times smaller fish yeah they will adapt better, better. Uh, right just because these fishes live together in a stream doesn't mean they're going to live together happily in a you know mm. smaller environment right because usually an ecosystem you know plays the role of say uh, you know a detritivore right eating the uh, you know uh, leftover Correct. food and things like that and then there are fishes which are predatory then there are fishes which eat algae for example and mostly they're all omnivores but you know with all these things it might not always work in a confined environment right so as much as possible i and observe their behavior in the wild before you bring right if you see something which is shoaling more likely there are peaceful fish right because there is not much aggression and the shoaling behavior is also to avoid predation right so that is something that you can consider another is once you bring in don't just dump the fish usually they will need some time to kind of acclimatize so kind of mix the water between mm. your tank and the source water 
and also you can float the bag in your tank water so that you know the uh, you know temperature kind of equalizes and they can right. slowly get adapted to that right and once you bring in do not put it into your display tank just because they do not have a disease or superficially they do not they do, it doesn't look disease. like they have a disease, disease yeah. doesn't mean that they are clean because you know that most of our uh, you know uh, waters are the, the urban and the outskirt habitats they are quite polluted right so you might inadvertently introduce a parasite or some other infection right so all always use a uh, like a bare bottom tank uh, with some hiding spaces like a pvc pipe or something like that or a terracotta pot where you can observe the fish for at least a week and then decide whether you want to move it and whatever trials you want to do it in feeding and all that it is best to do it there right and not transfer something which is not feeding correct it's going to get out competed by your you know your other fish. fishes if yeah. you're doing right other fish. obviously i would suggest that uh, you try and keep it uh, in uh, you know species tanks which means that one species per tank but i know most of us cannot do it so you know be very careful careful about the fishes that you are mixing because uh, when you mix something like is captive bred and something which is uh, from the wild you might be passing on some diseases on both sides right so that is something definitely that you I, I think I, I would like to add a couple of points here where see today with technology and uh, you know data being available everywhere that you travel mostly everywhere that you travel you know, there is an internet connection so if you see a particular kind of fish you know and if you do get a photograph compare it on google yeah you know understand read up before you actually catch and bring that yeah. fish but that's a huge advantage yeah, yeah. that we have today sure. right so that may be an added uh, value yeah, definitely and uh, like beta said uh, having an independent species tank is one good thing and also i would like to suggest is if you are keeping indian natives then keep only indian native you know don't put uh, any indian fish or like some barbs or something into a goldfish tank because uh, these are aggressive fish naturally yeah and not goldfish, just aggression yeah. i mean they can out compete for food exactly exactly like that. yeah uh, they can even harm the goldfish. Yeah, and yeah. they might have a different temperament. Goldfish is more sedate. Correct. While your docentia is like more boisterous. Yes. Swimming around. Yes. So, you know, you definitely you need to keep those things in mind. Uh, there is another point that comes to my mind where uh, when people go and plan and say that this is what we want to do. We want to go to some location and we want to uh, catch fish or even observe fish. What should they prepare for in a sense? Of course, the, the trip and the tour and travel and all is one part. Generally, I mean, what about, uh, what precaution should they take? Because like you said, most of these rivers and rivulets are all polluted. From, from a human perspective, they can also get infected, right? Yeah. So what prevention, like any kind of uh, boots or something that they can use yeah. or, you know, stuff yeah. like that. So uh, I think, I mean, at least I don't uh, use any precaution like gloves and all that. Um, usually I use a wading shoe and the normal yeah. dress. Yeah. But then what you need to be careful about is that most of our water bodies are also drinking spots for people. Yeah. So uh, there's been numerous cases when people have gotten cut up because there is a broken bottle. Bottle, somewhere. yes. This, I've seen this many yeah, times. Yeah, there's bro broken bottles and all that. Uh, you have to be aware of your surroundings, uh, especially because uh, sometimes you might get into a private pot property or you might mm. go into a, you know, something which is designated or as a national park or a wildlife Yeah, there is not definitely a, if there is no strict line that exactly. not everywhere yeah. you have a yeah. marker yeah. right so you need to be aware look at the maps and all that and be aware of your surroundings because fish share their surroundings with other animals mm. especially snakes and spiders True. and so on that so be careful of you know where you are treading so i guess in a sense do your homework you know, do your homework, talk to people and stuff like that. Bita, uh, I'm sure, you know, right now, even the audience are thinking the same and uh, I'm thinking the same. What if we could plan trips and people would want to join? Okay. Is that possible? Uh, it is possible. But then I've always preferred doing it in small groups because it's more... Small focused. groups are fine. But yeah. so like three, four people or whatever yeah. you say, you know, we can always make a small announcement and there could yeah. be a selection process and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would encourage people to even do it on their own we yeah. can definitely do something I or would you can be, let's let's say uh, besides the book on the fish uh, guide also to how to go and yeah that we can do i mean it can even be like a kind of like a workshop but in yeah, the wild yeah. you know, on how things to do Correct. what you need to do how do's and don'ts like observation that. yeah definitely we can do that yeah. but i mean just like how i started you know our group right we just uh, decided that you we'll know, go here. You will go yeah. here. And this is like we went on a trip to find canarenses. Okay, we decided we'll go there. Did the research, right? So yeah, like we 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 but we didn't plan hotel room, nothing. We yeah. were not we like we would sleep anywhere, eat anything. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I remember one uh, trip where I mean in terms of stay, we did zero planning and we were late in the night. There's no light anywhere. We were in a 
I mean, it, it was in a wildlife sanctuary and we were going and we finally found, uh, you know, guest house, the forest guest house and it was like eight people <laughs> sleeping in a small room with everybody tired and snoring, <laughs> right? So that's kind of a crazy experience. Yeah, those, yeah. those, uh, those are days. Yeah. Those are good days. Yeah. But see, one of the things that I would always suggest if you're really keen on this is to select resorts where there is a stream or there is a something like that because a lot of people advertise today. So your family is occupied, you can also take time yeah, out. Yeah. And that's a good start. You know, that's a very good start. And of course, there's a lot of um, like get a good net, get those uh, breathable bags or plastic bags, see what you can collect. And my thing is always, I think this is a, something that we've all wa- watched for. You know, don't be greedy. Yeah. Right. If you know you can't keep the fish, don't bring it back. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. That is something which yeah. is the most. What if you just thing. take a photo tank, yeah. put it in it, photograph, take, or take photos, a photograph. Yeah. I mean, the phones today are so good, so you should be able. Because to most watch. people they want the fish only for an Instagram yeah. reel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you are that kind of a, a fish influencer, then yeah, you can go ahead and do it. But then yeah, uh, that that whatever Mayur is suggesting is a good idea. But I would suggest that you get a snorkel because it's a different feeling actually being in their world, right? Instead of observing them from the world, top, yeah. right? From the top, because it's a different it's perspective. A different perspective. You'll see a lot of things other than fishes. Like I've seen a lot of diving beetles. You see worms. You see shrimps. You see, uh, you know, I've even seen uh, Sicilian, right? Which is an amphibian. So you see a ton of different things that you difficult to observe from the surface. So one of the first times I think in Andaman uh, when I went uh, snorkeling or diving and. And I remember there was this one one location, little part of a reef where uh, it was just very serene, beautiful. And uh, you know, these the tourist guides who are with you, they keep pushing, you know, go here, go there, look here, look here. I held his hand and I pushed him down and I said, sit. Okay. And I was quietly there. I was just observing. And you know, it changes the way you, yeah. you view things. And yeah. he kept nudging me. I mean, I almost would have hit him. Then he realized I want to relax. He thought something was wrong. Then I said, no, no, just sit. Okay. Be calm. And I, I think I must have sat there for five, eight minutes. It felt longer, but you know, it changes a lot. It changes. It is a, a life-changing lot. experience. First time you put your head under the water and you know get. I, I still the remember water. another incident. Yeah, the stories, stories keep coming. We were in Sangam, okay, okay yeah. Karnataka, yeah. beyond uh, Madhur Sangam, and uh, we were we were just generally there, and we were trying to catch shrimp. The, in Sangam, there is a place where they drag for shrimp, the macrobatchum shrimp with the okay. claws, yeah. because that's edible. Yeah. So, and they drag it through a Wallison area jungle. One is I wanted to understand the whole net because the way they drag it. The second is I wanted to see how it looks. And that Wallison area jungle, if you go and put your head down, I mean, you can't hold your breath. I mean, those days I could not for too long, but a minute, two minutes. And uh, it's it's a different world. Yeah. It's a whole different world. The kind of fish, the kind of uh, shrimp, the kind of snakeheads, what all you see, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. It you should experience it. I guess, you know, the passion comes from there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That will definitely trick us. So know, be, even before you go collecting and all of that, we work on experiencing, right? I think that's yeah. the take home from this <laughs> true, today. True. What would you like to add generally? Uh, because you've been in the hobby for a very long time. And uh, I usually say long time, even when I'm, I say a long time, because others people get to know our age and I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> interested. I'm 24, sorry, 23, 24. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The thing is, what would you generally like to tell a hobbyist? You know, today, uh, people, I think this generation, they want everything to happen quickly, Gen yeah. Z. So what is it that you would give them? Like if it's like a mm-hmm. word of advice or anything like that. And not a word of advice, but more like a suggestion, I would uh, say is that, uh, you know, get the younger generation to appreciate our water bodies because over the years, I, I think I've been going to the Western Guards for more than 20 years right now. I see a lot of uh, development, right? Mm. In terms of bridges, dams. Resorts. So many things are happening. But then there is no development that's happening for the beings that are there, right? So there is a lot of habitats which have been destroyed. Um, I remember a place in Coorg which used to have an amazing diversity of fishes, right? But last year, last year, October, I think I visited there. The whole place was, I mean, it changed that you couldn't recognize, recognize, right? It is so bad. And that stream actually had a huge diversity of fishes. So, 
what i would say is that i don't know how long this is going to last so i would appreciate because Enjoy I, it as long yeah, as it's there i don't think i'll be able to go to each place in india and document it so i will need you know people to you know help out in that especially True. with your interest True. especially i don't think you need to go all over the country right at least explore the areas around where you live and document that sure. so at least we know what yeah, used to live what there what is there or, yeah or if we, for future yeah, what, you know we can always yeah, refer yeah. and today we've got some amazing technology there are the gopros and yeah. your iphone can go into the water so yeah. yeah. you know yeah. there's not much of a yeah. problem there so you know make the best of it so uh, education knowledge experience and then the fish keeping so that's amazing so i have one uh, question that always keeps you know going on in my mind actually a lot of questions keep going on in my mind I, you know i keep asking you also but this is one relevant here see uh, when you get wild caught fish and uh, how what do you start feeding them or when do you start feeding them maybe one or two days i always say two days don't feed let the stomach get empty right. then you try whatever feeding what are your suggestions yeah i think you pretty much nailed the most mm. important thing that you know once you get them home don't try and feed them let mm. them first settle down right and then you start feeding them uh, you have quite a different set of requirements for different fishes like for example the bavani australis that i was talking about uh, they will not immediately take dry food mm. right so you will need uh, a bit of biofilm in that tank so which means that you need an established tank that is not something that you can replace easily right uh, or at least frozen food like on the other side if you are bringing in say a snake heads for example you know they will eat insects they will eat frogs they will eat uh, correct if there's a more a varied diet yeah. that they can eat and yeah. they they'll actually do it yeah. Yeah. meal worms and stuff like that yeah so as i said let it settle down nothing is going to happen even if they don't eat for a week yeah All right so see that's always a point that i keep mentioning fish are very strong they're very resilient yeah. you know they're not as delicate as you would consider or want them to be especially wild caught fish yeah. you know they yeah. they can go with food without a week also but yeah by then figure out what you want to feed them yeah you yeah. know dry food it's always a difficult situation yeah the most important thing is you maintain the water parameters parameters correctly you feed uh, food is not eaten and spoils so of you know water and that can cause more problems than not feeding it for a week right. see this is another video ch- topic that i've been uh, discussing on my channel as well is uh, see wild caught fish they are already living and i'm going to say this uh, in general okay they are already living in polluted waters because almost almost i won't say uh, every stream but almost every stream or river there is some contaminant or contamination or pollutant that's going in it may be human waste it may be soap it may be uh, uh, any kind of uh, chemical or otherwise industrial waste something is going into it and these fish are surviving in that on the contrary we have fish that we keep in nice water clean water they're bred in tanks and you know all of this and we see that wild caught fish are so much more resilient or hardy compared to these fish why do you think that is um i would say it's a generalization mm. because um and i can give you an example from valparai mm. right a uh, lot of plantations uh, but in terms of the fish diversity that you see in the streams that run around the you know the, the foothills of the plantation and all that the diversity is less but there are a couple of species like the malabar danios and mm. the garas mm. which have a good population there which means that the ones which are delicate probably have not been able to manage the you know the chemical runoff into the water right simply the largest garas that i've seen was in walpar again and i think it is called monkey falls or something like that it is a tourist spot mm. and there is this pool at the bottom of the waterfalls which has got probably a million shampoo packets mm. but it also has the, the largest garas that i've seen right do you think they're surviving on shampoo <laughs> i think there are enough dirty people that come to feed it very frankly right more than the shampoo packets i think uh, i think the are... dirt these people are generating <laughs> yeah yeah it's crazy yeah. Right? so it's kind of like you know i think the, over a period of time the evolution they get immune to it yeah there's yeah. some adaptation, adaptation some fish adapt well some fish don't adapt true, well true. the ones don't which don't adapt well you will not see them yeah. right that's why i've seen even after the you know the kerala floods uh, there is a fish called travan korea along it yeah. which is yeah. again uh, you know what you call a balletored loach mm. right which specialized to live in uh, you know high water flow areas mm. Mm. and they feed on the biofilm mm. and rocks right during the flood what happened a lot of silt and sediment settled all over the rocks uh, and and they are gone now i mean there are still a lot of fishes there but the ones that particular are, variety is yeah is because missing. their micro habitat has been it's destroyed gone. see beta i think if we we can go on with number of stories and stuff like that uh, 
and this video will keep going tell me one incident that uh, that's always there in your mind when you went to you know search for fish or something like that one particular incident that always stays with you or you you always talk about uh, i would say there are many uh, something that stays with you always yeah usually it's encounters with reptiles right. because uh, sometimes you're in the water and basically you're in bliss because you're in water that's your favorite place especially in the western ghats and suddenly there is a snake you know swimming by you right uh, <laughs> yeah, right I, that experience I, not, i wouldn't say i'm really scared of snakes but then it's still uh, it's still uncomfortable because you are in their territory and you're in water and you basically don't know don't know what to do what to do. right so that that is pretty common thing that we but i think a lot of uh, memorable experiences are there some which are sad there are some where really ex- experience the bliss especially when you know i have put on a snorkel and kind of sna- stayed in the water for 20 30 minutes just observing the fishes <laughs> no worries in your mind because see the beauty is i, I mean we've all been there you know once you once you go there you are in a comfortable position and if you say still after like 10 15 minutes the fish think that you are part of that environment yeah. and yeah. they start interacting around you you know yeah. they, they they forget that you are a human right or something as they think you are a wood or a stone or something like that and they keep moving pecking that's amazing how they yeah. quickly uh, adjust to something the whole new thing right. in that water body right yeah. Yeah. it's it's amazing it's amazing uh, this is see of course stories will keep going on i mean we can always go with stories and after stories but i think at some point we need to end and i want to see that book okay. <laughs> that's a lot Maybe, of pressure on yeah, me yeah yeah please please actually <laughs> not just me we want to see that book even if it's yeah. see i mean even if you give us like uh, karnataka or or western ghats and eastern ghats and you know i want to add this here uh, uh, beta has been mentioning western and eastern ghats western ghats is usually the mangalore all that mumbai downwards is the western ghats and eastern ghats is the andhra pradesh side yeah. or chennai downwards is the eastern ghats so yeah. for people who don't uh, you know or can't make that out you know th- that's one and even a short guide book for people who want to go and you know catch wild caught fish or go and experience this you know something small even if it's a write up and that we can share with them with a link something like that sure, would be sure. great yeah. that you could yeah. uh, add finally like we discussed in the beginning of this video uh, i believe that as hobbyist as hobbyist all of us wherever you are watching this from we should all get into saving the indian native species or indian native fish yeah. and species is a broader term because there are other species living in an ecosystem right so all of them because if you save one like if you save the tiger you save a lot of things so if you save that particular fish then you save a lot of things around it right, right? so this sub of there's probably a species that's eating that fish you know so if the fish dies that species dies as well something that we need to do we need to consider this so that it's like a wake up call maybe for the government and for the bureaucrats and stuff like that a wake up call for the hobbyist as well and i'm sure we'll come back and have this discussion and see what we can do about that yeah. okay and uh, my my request to all of you is to uh, use this hashtag save indian fish which is something that i am going to use every time i post anything on social media that i am going to try and use that hopefully you will do that too sure. and hopefully all of you will do it too so uh, beta uh, i i am hoping that we can do another segment of this video sometime in the near future yeah definitely. maybe we'll do another one more detailed maybe we'll consider a couple of species of fish and then discuss that you know more detailed species related video we can do yeah, yeah. that'll be great thank you again so much thanks for the okay. opportunity yes and uh, we'll we'll keep meeting and for all of you um, i hope you enjoyed this conversation there was a lot of uh, back and forth and uh, some funny stories and you know other stuff and if you want to get in touch with beta his uh, instagram and facebook links are in the description you can please connect with him okay and he'll be happy to help you with whatever yeah, definitely. queries yeah. or doubts that you yeah. may have again beta's uh, YouTube channel is called Mean Karan the link is also available in the description you can go and check it out so like all my other videos i believe that you would have enjoyed this video as well and of course today from my side beta and we are now sitting in aqua zones chennai uh, Hi, Shafi. from shafi bhai and all the team from aqua zones thank you namaste khuda fi shaba khair and sat sri akal we'll meet you all soon and i'm sure that will be really really interesting if you like indian native species and there's something more you want to know you can always ask and we will get you the information okay bye thank you